Senator Soft, would you please come on down here? Thank you. Tell you, I've traveled all around this state. I've probably been in every single county over the years. He's, he's one of the good ones. I'm telling you, he's one of the best ones we have out there, and I, I we appreciate what you do uh, for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate those kind words. Uh, I'd like to say hi to Russ, a good friend of mine from my district. Good to be here with Senator Lemke, who uh, I miss desperately bad yeah, in, the, in the Senate. <laughs> Um, you know, when I walked into the room, the lieutenant governor was talking about scanning the documents uh, for the database, and, and I could tell how important that issue is to all of you. Well, it does my heart good to see the mood of the Senate, who seem, that seems to be getting some traction, because after all, they've been trying to pass this prescription drug database, and I'm the one that stands up, you know, leading the charge to kill that. I mean, if you don't like your birth certificate being scanned, because, I mean, they already had your birth certificate. It's in the Department of Records. If you don't like that being scanned, how do you think, feel about having the personal medical information that your physician has ordered a medicine for you to be on a database which is accessible by 20,000 people in the state, in every doctor's office, in every emergency room and pharmacy in the state? I mean, come on. Uh, that's a uh, far more significant uh, <coughs> intrusion into your personal liberty, and I would encourage you to be telling uh, your senators and reps how horrible that is, and that you want that, that bill to die. Um, well, I can't, I can't even tell you because I'm not on the top of my head, but it's a prescription drug monitoring. So, uh, well, I made a few notes of some things that I'd like to talk about. First of all is that, you know, the effects of Obamacare are coming, and even though they pass the bill and they can read it, they, people still don't know, you know, what's really in it. But I can tell you some of what's in it. Basically, under Obamacare, they're getting rid of the uh, pre-existing condition uh, situation, and they're enacting what's called guaranteed issue. Which, what that means is, when you're having the chest pain and you're riding in the ambulance toward the hospital, you can call up your insurance broker and get coverage. And then after you have your $100,000 hospital stay, you can drop out of the program. So any person can know that the insurance rates that we're all going to pay are going to go through the roof because of this situation. It's, it doesn't require uh, a rocket scientist to figure that out. Now, today, uh, it was reported that the Society of Actuaries says that Obamacare will raise claim rates 32%, or raise the cost of claims 32%. But we've had Anthem Blue Cross tell us that uh, rates are going to raise 100% to 400%, depending on who you are, and an average of 160%. So that's going to take place in October. And come October, when people start getting their insurance rates going up this much, can you imagine what's going to happen? There will be gnashing of teeth. Tell me, what do you think that's going to do to our economy? I mean, when businesses have their costs go up that much, their profits are going to go down that much. That means that they're going to have that much less money to hire people and employ them. You're going to see the unemployment rate go up, you're going to see the revenue of the state go down, and you're going to see people purchasing go down. Because, I mean, after all, if you've got to spend the money for your health insurance, you're not going to be buying widgets. I, it, it's obvious as the nose on your face as to what's going to happen come October. So if you're worried about the state of Missouri voting for a one cent tax increase, that ain't gonna happen. People are gonna be so upset over spending so much more on their health insurance, they're not gonna vote for more taxes. Uh, and are all those things on the ballot, I wouldn't worry about them, you know, uh, because they're not gonna pass. 
people are going to be too stressed. Um, you know, our federal government now has this seventeen trillion dollars in debt, and the Federal Reserve is printing money at the rate of eighty-five billion dollars a month. Well, when does the hyperflation hit? When when is it going to hit? Well, the answer is is when people quit buying the debt. You know, when they start saying that's not a very good investment. Who knows when it will hit? But it will hit, and the government knows this is going to happen. I mean, if they didn't care, or if they cared, they wouldn't keep adding to the debt so much. This is their way out. This hyperflation solves their problem. Because it's it's just like a tax, except in or, instead of actually paying the money to the government, you're just losing that much value and the value of their debt goes down because of, of inflation. It's a tax, is what it is. And, you know, even, even uh, Ryan's plan basically says that they will balance the budget in 10 years. Well, how much is gonna get added to the debt in the next 10 years? I mean, I heard it was gonna be like 30 trillion or something. Is, I mean, even, even our best scenario is a horrible scenario. I mean, it's coming, and maybe, maybe somebody ought to consider buying gold. <laughs> <laughs> so, every day around this place, I find out something new that just makes my blood pressure go up. I think my doctor would probably like me to quit. <laughs> because it's bad for my health because of all these things that raise my blood pressure. So the other day we were in appropriations committee and you know the uh, we're we're looking at the budget and the governor recommended that we expand Medicaid. <laughs> well the line item for the expansion was eight hundred and eighty million dollars for the budget that the governor recommended. And that's for a half a year. It's really 1.7 billion for a full year. Mm -hmm. And that's how come they say by 2020 it'll be like eight billion dollars of federal money, you know, coming into the state. So one of the things that I found out, and you you never find this stuff out, they don't just like come out and tell you. I was at this Medicaid Oversight Committee, and um, they passed out a little sheet about the Medicaid expansion, and there was a little fine print there, and it said that providers will be paid at commercial rates. That's all it said. Well, what does that mean, providers will be paid at commercial rates? What it means is they're going to be paying them about double what they would be paying them under the current Medicaid program. Did you know that? Did you know that and what the implication of that is? When a Medicaid person comes to see me in my office, I might get like say, let's just say for instance, 25, 30 bucks, okay? A Medicare patient, it might be $70, and under commercial, it might be 100, okay? Well, Medicaid traditionally pays about 65% of Medicare which by definition pays 100% of Medicare. And they said in committee, because I asked them, how much will providers get paid under this uh, proposed expansion? The answer, 120 to 130% of Medicare. Now, I asked our analysts, how much would that line item be if it were pay being paid to the providers at the on current rates? The answer, 450 million. Did you know that? In other words, the department and the governor are planning to pay hospitals and providers 120 to 130% of Medicare, when right now they're being paid 65% of Medicare. Did you know that? So the federal government is paying all the money. I said, well, who made this decision? Well, Ian McCaslin, the head of the department, said, well, I had a lot to do with it. And I'm thinking, well, what was the limit? Why didn't you put down, you know, like 200% of Medicare? Might as well have. You know, it's free money. Might as well put 
pay yourself five times what Medicare pays. Where's the logic in this? What will be the end result? The end result will be that if you had Medicare and you go to your doctor, the doctor would be getting paid less than if you have Medicaid. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, basically, here's what it boils down to. I, I'm going to take a moment to give you a little lesson on hospital finances. Hospitals in Missouri get paid to cover their costs, okay? This, this box right here represents how much hospitals cost is in each country. And they can divide their payments into four buckets. You've got the, the no pays, people that don't pay anything, the private pay, the Medicare, and the Medicaid, okay? So they're not exactly, but about a quarter of each. Now, you know that hospitals get paid their costs, don't you? Because they're making money. In 2010, hospitals in Missouri made $861 million net after providing all the charity care that they're providing. I got that data from the Department of Health and Senior Services. I'll be glad to get to it. Let me know. Now, under Medicaid, under our statute, hospitals get paid their cost. So if it costs them a million dollars to provide the care for that chunk, that's what they get. Medicare pays them about their cost. They're paid on a different basis, but it works out to be about their cost. Now over here on the no pay, if you go to the hospital and you don't have any insurance, and you know, you, you either are gonna pay out of your pocket or you're gonna write it off or go bankrupt or whatever. A lot of people go bankrupt. <coughs> they get about 40% of their cost in what are called dish payments or disproportionate share hospital payments. Guess where the rest of that comes? Insurance. It comes from the private pay. It's added on way up here. In other words, when you go to the hospital and you have Aetna Blue Cross, Coventry, da da da, it's buried in your insurance rate that the hospital will get paid a lot more than what the cost of providing the care to you is. And that amount extra is used to pay for the uninsured, which is called the cost shift, okay? So you have to understand how this works. And then on top of that, that's where they get all their profit, way up here. So when you have private insurance, Coventry, Blue Cross, Aetna, da da you're paying for the cost shift and you're paying for the profit of the hospital. It's all in there. That's that $861 million that the hospitals <coughs> make. Now, under the Medicaid expansion, some of these people that are no pay now, how much is the hospital going to get paid now under the proposed Medicaid expansion? The, they're going to get paid at commercial rates. Okay. So if you are following what I'm saying, the proposed Medicaid expansion is a gigantic money grab windfall by the hospitals and the providers. Because now all of a sudden they get like double their, their payment. I mean, they didn't, they're not like taking down the cost that we're all paying in our health insurance. In fact, it's going to go up because I just told you a little bit ago. It's going to go up. The hospitals are going to come out like bandits here. And, and it should be criminal if people understood exactly what is going on here. I mean, it, it raises my blood pressure to, to think about it. But you never hear this, but I'm probably the only person saying it. Now, you've heard that the Medicaid expansion is going to increase jobs by 24,000. Well, I have to ask, you remember when they passed the stimulus bill and it was supposed to bring down the unemployment rate below 8%? Well, it's still at 7.7. Where were the jobs? Like, was it the same people that did the study? I don't, 
I don't believe that. How many of you have heard that if we don't take the money, well, they'll send that money to another state? Mm -hmm. That's just a bunch of baloney. Because if we don't take the money, it goes back into the United States Treasury. If some other state does take the money, it comes out of the Treasury. It's not like they're going to give them more because we took less. That is, that is misinformation. And don't fall for it. It's, people who say that should be ashamed of themselves or misleading. Like the governor? Really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, it did my heart good also to hear the comment made on the Senate floor the other day that with this regard to this Medicaid expansion. That we need to quit spending the federal government's money. And you know why? Because a couple of years ago, four of us called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, they named us, including <laughs> Senator Lemke, who, by the way, we named him Death. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to extend the unemployment benefits to two years. Two years! And so we stood up and we fought that, saying, let's not take the money from the federal government. We're used to that. But now, somebody else in the Senate is saying, hey, let's not take the money from that. Thank goodness. The tide seems to be turning. And I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad that there are, it seems to be that there are very many senators and reps now who don't want to expand Medicaid and who will not. Back in 2005, we cut back on Medicaid and because of the fact we did that, we put our state into a better financial position. And I remember we cut back on custodial parents from 85% down to at that point was 22% and, uh, of the federal poverty level because we couldn't go lower than that because of the federal law. They said you have to at least provide that. And I remember standing up on the floor of the house and I said, we should not be doing this. We should not be going from 85% to 22%. This is wrong. We should go all the way to zero. And we should have, because it's wrong to take money from one working citizen and give it to another. That's called redistribution of wealth. <laughs> now we're going. To, now they're contemplating putting all of those people back on, and a whole lot more. And we can't afford it. The bill will come due. Our company is going to have. Our country is going to have hyperinflation. And I'm going to tell you. I can only speak for myself personally. But if this bill does come up on the floor, and if I were the only senator that were opposed, I would stand until my legs fell off filibustering this bill. And then, just to get even if they passed it anyway over my objection, I filibuster everything else. <laughs> The prescription drug monitoring bill is Senate Bill 233 and House Bill 347.